learned a lot during my visit to Jean Woodhill's garden in Dayton, Ohio. From selecting different varieties of dogwood for an extended period of bloom, to a way of getting more flowers on monk's hood, Jean was full of great ideas. I couldn't wait to see what she had to say about the clematis varieties growing all along a fence just off the back of her house. Jean, this is Hagley Hybrid, this clematis. Yes, and I like the fringe on the pink. It's really, really hardy. Happy so, growing into here. Yeah, I love it growing up on the bird's nest spruce. With your clematis along the fence here and growing up into the bird's nest spruce, do you, what do you do at the end of the season? Are you of the school leave them be or do you prune them back? Or I think I like the idea best of uh, pruning it in three heights. If you prune it at three heights, it blooms at different times. So you, you prune different well, you pr stems on the same plant? Yeah, you'd prune these stems over here, down here, and you'd prune these stems over here, here, and prune these stems over here. And when do you prune these? Well, spring or fall. Spring or fall. Yeah. So it's all current season's growth that it's blooming on. Yeah, and then there's, then also, Sometimes I let them go just to see what'll happen. And, and I this think is that what happened happens. this year. <laughs> so they really, th these plants put on all this growth in one season? Oh, yeah. And this yellow foliage is it's probably a virus, but it's actually kind of pretty right now. I think it's and pretty. And look, there's a different, uh, completely different clematis. Pale lavender I and like one that. more to come. That's beautiful. But the white, white, white flowers, there's something about them. They really are, they Miss, catch your attention. They do. This Miss Bateman is a beauty. Absolutely. And I use two inch chicken wire to grow most clematis. Now, why but, do you do that? I mean, what's. Well, uh, two inch, the, the plant can get through. One inch is too little. It has a terrible time. And I paint it flat black so that you can't see it. Good tip for growing clematis just chicken wire, two inch. Two inch Not chicken the wire. one inch. Paint it flat black and it'll yeah. disappear. I think gardening is very creative. It's meaningful entertainment. It makes you feel good, keeps you healthy. I just think the rewards are endless. Graceful and eye catching garden spots. Lee, we're in Seattle and it's summer and I can't think of any place with better weather than right now, this blessed cool and your garden feels so fresh and vibrant. We're in a little secluded oasis. You've got this wonderful holly hedge that undulates up and down curves and really encloses the property. And, mm -hmm. and at the same time welcomes us into your garden. The hollies were put here between 1880 and 1900. Wow, that so, long ago. Yes, it was a holly farm from Lake Washington all the way up to Seward Park Avenue South. And this is what's left. You've and got this is the, what's left. the remnants, but right. they're hardly remnants. This huge hedge that's yeah. straight on this side of your property. And then what about how you've pruned it here? It's very it almost takes on the shape of an animal. It is an animal. This is a dragon. <laughs> when we got here, this hedge was very fat and wide and about three times as high. And it was clearly uh, not uh, wanting to be a hedge. So we pruned this uh, lump of... <laughs> <laughs> lump of this, holly? This lump of holly into Augustus, who is our uh, pet dragon. On that whole side, he continues clear down to the bottom. And then there's a hemlock hedge at the bottom. So the property really feels sort of held, I think, by the hedges and by the greenery. It does. Which makes it feel restful. Very here. soothing. Yeah, yeah. You've got this magnificent specimen, this pine that just goes and goes. I don't know how tall that is, but it's obviously been here a long time. It has been here, I think, since the late 1930s planted by Mrs. Lauren Grinstead, who was the first plant acquisitions chair at the Arboretum. I had heard when we first moved here from a neighbor about a sort of mythical Mrs. Grinstead that was responsible for planting the Himalayan white pine and the Camperdown elm. And so when I went to the Arboretum, I looked back in the files. I found a small article that she had put in the bulletin thanking all of the people who had given plants to the brand new arboretum, 
signed Mrs. Lauren Grinstead Plant Acquisitions Chair. So that explained why she had some of these wonderful plants and why I suppose a few of the extras from the Arboretum got to come to this property. So it's not the tallest Himalayan white pine in the state, but it is the oldest Himalayan white pine. And the cones are so distinctive and long. I don't know of many pines with cones that long. Hmm. And I think that's one of its claims to fame, the fact that its cones can reach 18 inches. But it comes from the same part of the Himalayas where deodor cedars come from. And we have two of those marking the entrance of the property. So we know that it's hardy wherever those are hardy. One of the fascinating things about living in Seattle is that we can grow plants from so many parts of the world. And a lot of people here have been very heavily influenced by English garden style. A lot of other people here love Japanese gardens. And so one of the things that's happening in Seattle is that we're developing a style that pulls together English and Asian a gardening style and plants. A lot of green makes the garden restful. And that's very much how Japanese gardens are designed, with lots of green, very little color. And yet if you add the colorful, flower-oriented gardens of England, you can get you know, a good blending of interest as well as restfulness. And that Camperdown elm, that is a large specimen. Yes, I think it's 65-something years old. And it's just this green sort of veil here. And what a great, clever gate that you've used to welcome you to the inside of the tree. Right, right. It really is a tree house. And the gate was made by Sue Skelly, who made all of the wattle work on the property. It's all cedar wattle so that it will survive in our climate, even though in England, uh, wattle is usually made of willow. And that's the same wattle all throughout your garden. Right. And right. that's beautiful the way it encloses the vegetable garden here. It's sort of a vegetable garden in a basket. And the outdoor shed, you can see, has our cones oh. and the cedar wattle work also decorating the shed. So it sort of uh, holds the place together aesthetically. One of the unique plants Lee inherited with the property is an elm with room enough for a tea party inside its weeping, twisted limbs. Visit Lee's treehouse when we continue. Lee Knapp worked as an educator when she moved to Seattle and quit teaching in 1994 to educate herself about gardening. She did such a good job that the Washington Park Arboretum hired her to edit their quarterly newsletter. Her job at the Arboretum also gives her the opportunity to learn more about the unique plants and trees that inhabit her historic property. We're standing under this incredible tree that just almost doesn't look living because of the way the branches just all twist. You can't believe that it's still living when they can all twist and turn like this mm -hmm. all the way up the trunk. And this is a Camperdown Elm? A Camperdown Elm. Olmus glabra, Camperdownii. And uh, what a specimen it is. Tell, tell us about how long it's been here. And I think it's been in this spot since about 1938. This kind of graft on the American elm trunk and this Scots elm top was first done at Camperdown House in Scotland about 1860. Hence the name Camperdown. Camperdown yeah, elm, okay. yeah, yeah. So this is a particularly wonderful one, I think, because it was obviously pruned well over the years. Oh, and it's just great. What happened when you found this property? Well, it's horrible to admit that when we found the house and this much land in Seattle, we didn't even know what was growing here. You didn't care. We didn't care. So this was a real bonus. That's right, right. And I had no idea what it was. I had no idea what any of the trees around the property were at that time. We were just amazingly fortunate that we purchased a property that had had such wonderful gardeners living here. You've got all these different foliage textures and colors, a dark uh, loripetalum foliage here and the semisa fuga, which has a beautiful burgundy colored, I would say. This whole corner is basically uh, a black, red, and white section of the garden. And, and it extends all yes, the way up. Right, all the way to the magnolia tree over there. This part of it has the very dark foliage, 
and um, in some sections some variegated foliage to give it light such as this miscanthus morning light. This is the hydrangea paniculata floribunda which might be my very very favorite hydrangea. And it blooms later in the season than a lot of the hydrangeas mm -hmm. and those big white fluffy heads. Oh they're just fabulous you can dry them for the winter and the nice thing about it is that it blooms on new growth. Right. So you can cut it to whatever size you want it to be. And you don't lose that year's bloom like you do with many hydrangeas. This is fun here. You've got this variegated salvia. Is that Gregii or? I, I think it's a Gregii cultivar. And um, that's a beautiful, uh, I like the juxtaposition of the mm -hmm. red, red flowers and the pale green and the white edged. I just love that. And then right through the middle, it, it doesn't seem like you'd expect to see an Acrociana, but isn't right. that fun to have it? Is that Sylvesterus? Yes. And behind it is a Calacanthus with red flowers from, from California, Calacanthus occidentale, which is, I think, a cousin of the one that blooms in Florida with the same kind of flowers. Right. We, and we grow it in the south, uh, in Georgia as well. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. didn't mention this wonderful lily that the calicanthus is a trellis for. Right. It holds all these up. There's just a wonderful collection of lilies here and I don't even know which they are. They were sort of in a batch of lilies that I think had gotten mixed up. So fortunately most of them blend quite well there. And the dark dahlia has both the black foliage that you like and yeah. the red flowers. And this wonderful little ground cover rose called eye opener. This is really one of my very favorite roses because it doesn't get any diseases. And as you can see, it's a short rose that uh, just fills in wherever it can and blooms and blooms and blooms in exactly the right color for this area. Oh, and from here you get a view, a great view of Lake Washington. You take it for granted, I'm afraid, after a while. Gardening. You take it for granted. <laughs> I take it for granted. Yes, gardening in such a beautiful space. It really is a treat. The border over here is a lot more muted. Well, at, particularly at this moment, it's another excuse for organizing things with, by color. And this is um, a yarrow called Walter Funk, which Great starts name. red, right, and then ends up orange. So it starts red and then gets softer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. But it doesn't really bleach out like a, a lot of yarrows do, and it stands up. It lasts a lot longer than some. And it's a true perennial. Yes. And with this soft yellow in the back and that nephophia, oh. Well, and of course, Walter Funk has the same kind of lovely lace cap top as the shrub does, the Buplerum fruticosum, Blue with the chartreuse flowers. Oh. I think that's a tender shrub. Now, what zone do you consider this? Eight. Eight. But and I grow you, things that are tender for eight, too. I would think because of the lake, mm -hmm. and you've got a little microclimate here, mm -hmm. you can grow a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. When we return, Lee's vegetable garden includes several varieties of thornless blackberries, as well as roses grown strictly for their thorns. HG. Lee Neff's vegetable garden produces for her year-round, thanks to Seattle's mild climate. Even here, Lee continues to create beautiful plant combinations to complement the vegetables she grows. Your vegetable garden is beautiful. It's really more ornamental to me. I wouldn't think of it as a vegetable garden. You've got dahlias and dahlias with fennel. That combination makes a bouquet just on its own. That dahlia was on the property when we got here. So were a number of these dark red ones and others. Well, how did you decide to site the vegetable garden here and did you always intend to mix in ornamentals? There was a vegetable garden here. This was the part of the garden with the best sun. So we thought that that made sense to go mm. ahead and put it here again too. And then because Rosemary Vary had flowers in her vegetable garden, I decided I had to do that. And it seemed to me that the dahlias were particularly appropriate. That dahlia is stunning. The form and the color. I love that one. That's Lauren Michelle, and that's a relatively new one. 
And in Seattle, as far as dahlias go, how do you treat them? Do you dig them up or you leave them in the ground all year round? And leave them in the ground. That's my kind of plant. That's, that's a good, easy plant. And sometimes it freezes a little bit of the top layer of tubers. But you can see with a clump that size, there's always going to be underneath ones that come back. And here it is summertime and you still have lettuce. Our evenings are still in the 50s, so the, the lettuce goes longer. My grandchildren are absolutely wonderful. Two girls, Alexandra and Samantha. Sam said to her grandfather the other day that this garden was her favorite place in all the world. And they love to do the vegetable gardening and the berry picking. So we've made the grandchild berry bed for them so that when they come in August, all of the things that will be at their peak are easy for them to pick. The blackberries, the blueberries, they dig the potatoes. They enjoy that. Not only do you have vegetables and fruit trees, you've got these wonderful, are these blackberries? They are. These are actually thornless blackberries. There are two cultivars that have been bred to be thornless. And this one that has these huge, huge long canes is called Loch Ness. Like the monster? Yes. So they love that. <laughs> right, very aptly named. And there's a smaller, tasty one on this end called Arapaho. Okay, I see it. That's, yep. that's the Arapaho, and this is the Loch Ness. Right. And then you've got blueberries. Yes. And strawberries. And that is a beautiful looking strawberry. Usually you just see the little tiny ones, but that looks like a good selection. These are ever bearing strawberries and evergreen blueberries. And the birds don't seem to get as many of these blueberries as the high bush ones. So that's a way to get children interested. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, very much. And they love the chives. They come out and eat those. This is an unusual border in your bed of herbs here. You've actually got a footboard from a bed. Yeah, it is a footboard. And of course, when you've carried something around the country for years and years and years, it's nice finally to have a use for it. <laughs> My husband and his twin brother were born in these beds wow. when they were uh, born in Mexico in 1932. So these have quite a history in our family. And we carried them from one house to another <laughs> and finally found a use for them here in this garden. This combination of dahlias, verbascum, and sunflowers, it's stunning to have the yellow of the verbascum and that red dahlia and then the rusty sunflower. I don't know which sunflower that is, but I'm not sure there's either. There's so many now. And that one sowed itself there. The point of growing the verbascum with the dahlias is to have the verbascum hold the dahlias up. Oh, a living steak. Yes. That works well. <laughs> it seems to work. I let it go to seed each year and then cull the ones that um, are not in the right place. And this rose with yes. these thorns. Yes, Rosa cerisia pterocantha. The rose that you grow for the thorns. <laughs> I love that one. And yeah. the fuchsia makes me think of Seattle because it fuchsia seems to do so well here. This has sort of a golden or chartreuse cast to the foliage. My very favorite one, yes. It's, I think it's Fuchsia Magellanica aurea. And we have a lot of hummingbirds here. Mm -hmm. And so this corner attracts the hummingbirds with this marvelous fuchsia and some of the salvias in the herb garden. What happens to fuchsia in the winter do, here? Does it just die back or does it lose its leaves? It loses its leaves. In the last six or seven years, they haven't died back at all. Wow, it's beautiful. Visit Lee's Rock Garden, where she breaks away from organizing plants by color and focuses on plant textures when we continue. It by splitting up the area into many distinctive gardens, Lee Neff's Seattle property seems much larger than eight tenths of an acre. Her passion for collecting is never more evident than in her rock garden. This is a fairly steep embankment, and you've got these boulders strategically placed. I'm assuming that you put them here. Yes. And what was this like when you started the garden? All the area of the rock garden was actually a grass island in the middle of a circular driveway. So it was sort of lawn with uh, four flower beds surrounded by asphalt 
and the flower beds had hybrid tea roses, dahlias, and peonies. But I wanted a rock garden. I was interested here in um, working with textures of plants, trying to have lots of things that would look good year round. And this Eryngium or Eryngium, that has very distinctive texture. It's very sharp. It's, yes. it's Eryngium verifolium, and it seeds here well. And um, that's a hardy perennial? Yep. Quite hardy. This is the flower at this yes. stage, and so that'll right. stay like that, and, and what happens when it finishes? Then they just turn brown, and these are all the seed heads. And so I collect the seed to, sh to share with others in the Perennial Alliance seed exchange because lots of people like to grow this. It's a good low growing one that doesn't need any support. And you've got a few flowers in here, but as you mentioned, a lot of texture, a lot of foliage. With this Hebe cupressoides, which That's is so nice, pretty. and the, the Camisiparuses to give some evergreen color. And the Zauchneria. Yep, the Zauchneria californica is the red, wonderful red hummingbird plant in this area because they want to get the hummingbirds closer to the house if we can. So I think a lot of people may think of a rock garden as a small, fussy sort of area, but really that's not the only type of rock garden. You've, you've got right. the conifers here for your winter interest and all the different types of foliage textures. It is fun to look at it year round from the house. I think that's my goal. When I started gardening, the thing that interested me most was growing beautiful plants. And I think now, I'm interested in the sense of completeness that comes when you put a grouping of plants together and they seem happy in that place. So I think that it has changed to being more interested in creating a bountiful and restorative space.